Okay, everyone, books out, please. We're on page 98. Bit of a sore throat today, so I don't want to shout too much. So here at the back, if you could all focus. Phones away, please, right now. Page 98. Today we're discussing the idea of miracles in relation to Hanukkah, in relation to Purim, and actually miracles in general. What's the Jewish view of miracles? Did they exist? Do they exist? Will they exist again? What is their purpose? And what are we meant to get out of them? I think I saw a study that most people in America, something like 80 to 90 percent of people in America, when asked whether they had personally experienced a miracle, answered in the affirmative. They felt that something had happened to them which defied the laws of nature, defied the laws of reason or, or possibility. Um, page 98. You're welcome. So let's have a look into this. What's the Jewish idea of miracles? Let's start with the word itself. How do you say miracle in Hebrew? Nase. Nase is correct. Nase in the singular. In the plural it is? Nisim. That is correct. I had a friend in my class, actually still a friend of mine, I've seen him in many years though, whose last name was Nisim. And his first name was Nisim. Oh yeah. Nissim Nissim. My French teacher used to call him Nissim Squared. <laughs> Double miracles right there. You like that name? Is that good? Very nice guy. Okay, Nissim Nissim. Now, as we say in all classes, <coughs> any word in Hebrew is going to reveal something else to us. Where else do we see the word Nis? What else does it mean? It's got to mean something else in order to make sense, right? For us to find and make sense of it. So the word nace also means, anybody? A banner or a flag. A banner or a flag. Would someone like to tell me why the same word for miracle equals a banner or a flag? Yes, Hannah. So flags can be seen, they're visible, and uh, miracles as well, by definition. I mean, sometimes the miracles uh, can be seen as well. Yep. Anybody else? I see you're all awake on this Monday morning. That's marvelous. Yes. The flag of Hashem. Well, that's a nice idea. I don't know what that means, but it sounds good. <laughs> the flag of Hashem. What does a flag do? Let's start with that. Or a banner. It signifies something. What does it signify? What does it signify? Whatever's on it. Whatever's on it. And, and wherever it is. So it usually has an emblem on it, which signifies something, and it's also in a location. Or you put flags in places that we conquer, that we take over. Right? Hence when America, you know, landed on the moon, right? They put a flag in there as if to say, we own this area. Why anyone wants to own the moon is not a question for now, I guess. Right? But when they conquer territories, come in and they put a flag down. Jewish, actually Jewish history <coughs> is full of flags as well. Flags, each one of the Shvatim had their own flag, right, which signified its mission in this world. Uh, then there were groupings of flags for various groupings. Israel today has a flag. So flags represent, they banner, they show to conquer territory. Miracles as well show that something happened here, something of significance, something of value, and something that has to be spoken about and publicized to the world, because that's what flags do. They publicize to the world. What is the word world? How do you say the word world in Hebrew? Olam. 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 What else do we see in the word Olam? What other word do we see? Hidden. Right. Helam. So it's Helam. It is hidden. Right. So the world itself, the word world itself actually means hidden or to hide. Why? Why is that? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu, God hides himself in this world. If you will, he puts a mask, puts a mask over the world. Okay? Our job is to pierce through it. What is the mask called? What do we refer to this mask as? Follow carefully. There's different parts of this. Guys and girls, or just girls actually, you've got to focus on this, all right? So please, if you're on computers, only to blank pages. What is the word for... Um, Nature in Hebrew is Teva, that's correct. All 
okay? Before it was a sandal that everyone fell in love with, right? Nature. Now the word teva also means something else. We sit inside there. Or drown. Right, to sink in. To sink in. Because you could look at this world, you could look at nature, right? The natural process of this world, and say that's all there is. You can sink into it. But the word nature and sink in teva is actually to another word which is going to help us, which is a matbeah. What's a matbeah? It's a coin. A coin. What's a coin? It's a print. An imprint of the spiritual world. Okay? So the word teva has within it the idea of a coin, right? Or really an imprint is probably better. Okay, let's pull all this together. Okay, so we see that miracles are banners or flags that happen, events that happen in this world. Okay, we'll define actually what defines a miracle itself a little bit in a few moments. Okay, the world itself is olam, it's helam. God hides himself in this world. What does that mean? God puts something called teva, nature, into this world. There's a danger, and that is that a person can sink into the natural world and think, well, this is all there is. Right? The world just carries on and just is. Right? It doesn't have a beginning, it doesn't have a middle, it doesn't have an end. It's just an endless, random uh, event of atoms banging and crashing into each other. And that's the end of it. However, we say no. Because Tav is also matbeah. What's a matbeah? A coin is an imprint. Right? It, it's embossed, if you will. It's an imprint of something else. So the world, we say nature, has on it an imprint of the spiritual world. The two go hand in hand. Okay? So what is the job? The job is to pierce through the natural order and see God, the spiritual world, within the natural world. We're going to see the sun and think, wow, what an amazing world God created. We see God behind the natural events of this world. That's really, in a nutshell, the job of the Jew. What's interesting is that the Greeks were totally against this idea. One of the main differences between the Greek theology, uh, philosophy and Jewish theology was that there's a God that created the world. There was a beginning. And actually now, for the past, I don't know, 60 years, even science agrees there was a beginning. Right? They refer to it uh, as the Big Bang. Uh, when two uh, scientists, uh, one of them was actually Jewish, uh, Wilson and Penzians, discovered that there was a Big Bang in the world. It's actually a pejorative term when a journalist coined it. And said the world actually started from one point and kept moving on and expanding from that point onwards. Okay? They heard that original bang from the beginning. Right? We are okay with that. Right? The timing of it, who created it, is something else. So the idea that God created the world, the world is yesh ma'ayin, ex nihilo, right? It started, it's something from nothing, is how we see the world. And the Greeks were against that. Right? They saw what you see is what is, and that's the end of it. There's no spiritual element. Right? If there is a God, and what? it's just God cannot influence the world, has no interaction with the world. And we the Jewish people, the whole base of Jewish faith is that there is a God, and there was a beginning, and God interacts with this world. Okay? The natural order is just the way God used the system that was set up to get the world going and keep the world going. What's important, though, is if God created the world, and if God keeps the world going, at the same time we can say that God, if he wants to, for some reason will make a decision to change the natural order. Okay, so here's the next question. Are we clear on this so far? A lot of pieces we throw in there. If that's true, what are these interruptions of nature called? So there's two types in Jewish thought. There's two types of interruption that we see in the world. Two types of miracle. Okay? What are these two types of miracle? One is referred to as Nes Nistar. Nes Nistar refers to as hidden miracles. Hidden miracles, yeah, that's what I'm calling it. Okay. Hidden miracles. Right. Nice stuff. For example, I mean, this stuff we still have. Right? A person may feel as though God inter came into their life. It's hard to know. Maybe yes, maybe no. Certain things happen. They meet certain people. It could be anything. It could be a random events that occur which defy or are too improbable to have just occurred in and of themselves. Okay? There's some kind of break in the natural order that allowed this event to happen to a person. Now, these may happen to us personally, but they can also happen to us as a people. Right? An example of a nascent star in Jewish history would be... Purim. Purim, yeah. Purim 
is the paradigm, if you will, of Nesis of hidden miracles. Okay? God is who hid himself. Right? Anochi has to ask the says God, I am going to surely hide my face uh, in Deuteronomy. And then we see later on that God as well hides himself and allows certain events to happen and occur. It's a series of possible coincidences. Can we prove it's miraculous? No. Right? On the surface, it looks like a regular Purim story, a regular story, right, of a crazy king who was a dictator whose wife had to die. It happens to be that some lady called Esther, actually her real name was Hadassah, right? gets the job of his wife. It happens to be that her uh, cousin Mordechai happens to take on certain roles and, and they happen to be invited to a feast. And it just goes on and on. Random events, which we as Jews say, wow, that's miraculous. Right? But it's a hidden miracle. But there's another type of miracle. And that miracle is called the Nes Nigla. Right? Which is the revealed miracle. Now, Jewish history was rich with the revealed miracles for a long time. All right? Open the Bible, and it's full of revealed miracles. All right? Left, right, and center. <coughs> right? For a long, long time. It, revealed miracles carried on. Revealed miracles are public events where a number of individuals see that banner of God, if you will, and see the revealed nature of God. Right? The most famous of them begins with the Jewish people became the Jewish people, which is all the plagues in Mitzrayim, Right? They defied nature, uh, each one of them in their own way. For discussion of that, you've got to go into Pesach in order to figure that out. Right? The splitting of the sea doesn't happen. Now, having said that, and this is important, you never see a revealed miracle in anywhere in the Bible that doesn't always have a possible, rational, non-miraculous possibility. There's always something attached to the miracle. Okay? Before the sea split, a wind came all night, the Torah tells us. Okay? Before we see a child is resurrected, right, the Bible, Elisha, we see that he warms his body up. There's always, before oil can be put inside vast amount of vessels, okay, there's a little bit of oil inside one of the vessels. Right? You start with something. It never comes from nothing to something. It always has something there. There has to be some rational explanation. All the makos, all the makot, right, in Mitzrayim, in Egypt, all the plagues that came, Mo, uh, either Moshe Rabbeinu or Aaron, had to do something. They had to lift up sand and throw sand. They had to do something in order to make it happen. There was always some possibility. Why? Why do you think that even in the world of Nes Nigla, do we see there has to be some possible rational non-miraculous element that is attached to it. Do you have to answer the question of another yeah. question? Yeah? Um, so, so this test a person's faith? Well, uh, to test a person's faith may be one, but really comes to help them because without that, we have lost our free will. There must always be free will, and that's Bechira. Okay? So attach, attach to every nice niglad, always is this way. Look at every miracle. Right through the Bible, which there's tons and tons of them, there's always the possibility of a rational explanation to all of them. It's never complete. God always leaves room for a person to have free will, because if it's completely a miracle from nothing to something, then our free will is shattered, and we can't get the choice to, look, to, to choose. Right? And this world is all about having free will. So, Nes Nistar is in a miracle, take it as you will. Nes Nigla always must have an element of possibility, and that's the world of Bechira, the world of free choice. And so this carried on for a long time. Miracles kept coming again and again and again until they didn't, until they stopped. Until they stopped. When was the last, probably one of the most famous last open miracles in Jewish history? Hanukkah. The Hanukkah story really because there were so many miracles. We don't celebrate all the miracles after the Jewish people. There were tons of miracles that people knew about, understood, and saw, right? However, the Hanukkah miracles are very important because at this time, we start to see the breakdown of the spiritual system. And this was really one, if not the last open miracle that happened to the Jewish people. Now, that miracle happened in two forms. We're going to see that it was the miracle of the oil, 
and the miracle of the military defeat. Two different miracles, and I'm going to discuss both of them uh, with the sources. But that's the background you need to get. Okay, once the Hanukkah story occurred, that was it. Right? The spiritual lights turned off, and we had to wait and go right through Galut, through the exile of the remaining time to the coming of Mashiach, when miracles will actually restart. Right? We will get to a miraculous time once again. We're actually so great will the miracles be, according to some opinions, that they will put the Pesach miracles to shame, or to second place, I should say. Yes, Neta. Um, Right, around that same time, right, Navu itself started to break down as well. The two go hand in hand, yeah. Yeah. Um, is that why Hashem only gave his nature when he performs miracles? Like he, meaning like with all the scientific discoveries, they always, there's always... It's always in the understandable natural cycle. That's always that way, right? It's, it's something, it's something, not from nothing, from something. Right? Every miracle is something from something, and it's always got to follow the... the na- there's a natural phenomenon that goes with every single one. The question is, why did I have to stop? This is a very important question we have to discuss. In order to understand what miracles are, we have to understand why they stopped. Why did they stop at that time? What actually happened? Right? Is God being cruel to us? Okay, you're on your own now. Right? You're about to go into the darkness right? of the exile. It's a physical exile, it's a spiritual exile. Right? Why did they stop? Yeah. Probably because he wanted the next biggest miracle to be the Shiach. We probably wanted to wait until we get to that. Okay, point. but we have to wait because so long? What? My real question is, a real question, I mean, that's obviously the answer, but my real question is, why? What is it that at that point things stop? What creates a miracle? Well, let me ask you better. Who creates a miracle? Who creates a nace is the question. Hashem. Hashem. That's true. God does but there's always a catalyst in this world. Who is the catalyst in this world? People. People. Right? This is a very, very Jewish idea. The Greeks were not into this. Right? We humans have no impact, nothing in the, there's, first of all, there's no spiritual world, and there's no relationship between what happens in this world and people. Right? We say, no, we pray for rain. Right? We pray to God. We pray for blessings. We believe that people have the ability, this is very important, to bring spiritual blessing into this world. Okay? Either through natural means or sometimes unnatural means. People have the ability. <coughs> this is a very important idea. Okay? In the merit of certain people, it goes right back. In the merit of Miriam, we had the well and the water came with us. Yeah? In the merit of Moshe Rabbeinu, we had the Torah given us. It's always going to be people who instigate this. We believe that individuals have the power Right to channel God's blessings and bring them in this world. Sometimes they are hidden miracles, and sometimes they are revealed. So if that's true, here's the punchline, if that's true, why would miracles stop? If that's true, then why would miracles stop? If that's what brings miracles, then why would they stop at a certain point? For a person, or a time, or... Because we don't deserve it, exactly. Right? We don't merit those miracles. They come in a certain merit. What is that merit? Is there an underlying merit that goes right through that allows us to see miracles come into this world? Right? We assume they did exist, they stopped existing, and they'll exist again. So what is it exactly is the question. We're still talking outside. You have to follow outside for a minute. Yeah. How would we know that we don't marry it? Like, who did, like, how did, how did we So know we that see, the because it stopped. stopped. It stopped. Right, once once these, these, these still exist, okay. people can merit this, as far as we know. Yeah? It could be happening all the time. It could be right now. It could be in this room. I don't know. All right? It could be a person, heaven forbid, should die, and Hashem allows a hidden miracle to fill the mental out and live. Who knows? Right? Their bodies defy medical science. <coughs> Who knows? But you can explain right. that through science. Though, you always can. Nace, nace, you always can. Even Nace Negli can explain through scientific means. A wind came, happened to be the right time, 
and Moses knew the right time for the sea to split. He was in the right place. You look at the detail. So we are always given a small avenue, a small vehicle to allow rational explanation to everything. So, no, so I'm saying then doesn't that just mean that miracles don't exist? Yeah. Like, so that's a, you could take that view. A person good. We Jews don't. We believe no. God has the ability and has the time when he allows nature to stop and define nature, right? We believe those stories to be true. Yeah. And Hanukkah represents that. And it's hard for us because we haven't seen this. Right? For 2,000 years we've been without, quote-unquote, open miracles. We haven't got to see it. Right? I mean, we see certain things in our lives. Create the state of Israel. The miracle. We see certain things, but are they ever definitive? Are we tired? It's murky. We're in the darkness. Hanukkah comes at the darkest time of the year because it represents the darkness of the spiritual exile we've been in since the destruction of the Second Temple, right, from the Greek times. And that's why we light a light. That little candle represents the spiritual light of miracle that we take with us through history. It's very small. It's very, very small. But what allows us to do it? We said, great people. Great people can channel this. In their merit, they can bring miracles to this world. What goes against that? That we don't have such individuals. So I'll tell you the story about an individual that most of you have never heard of before. Uh, however, he's considered to be one of the greatest miracle makers in Jewish history. And his name was, anyone know from the Talmud, most famous miracle poet? Whenever they wanted miracles happen to the Jewish people, right, great merit, they sent him. Off you go. Very great man. His name was Hanina ben Dosa. Hanina ben Dosa was his name. And there's many stories in the Talmud about this great, great individual. And I'll share one of the stories for you. And by looking at the story of Hanan Mendoza, I hope to, we'll get an understanding a little bit and appreciation. And then we'll go into the miracles of Hanukkah specifically to figure out why they came, when they came, what they represent. Okay. So uh, there's a number of stories, but I'll tell you one. This is like a, a classic story of Hanan Mendoza. It's found in the Gemara uh, in Tanit. And the Gemara tells a story of Hanan Mendoza whose daughter had to light the, Shabbos, the Shabbat candles, the Shabbat lights. And in those days there were candles, there was oil. So she went to the, to the store, wherever they were, to buy oil. And oil, you know, was an expensive product. It wasn't easy to get hold of, you know. In those days there weren't many items. People had whatever they had and that was the end of it. So off she goes and she comes back and it was Erev Shabbat. She's about to light the candles. And then she realized that she made a mistake. She burst out crying. And her father, Hanina ben Dosa, comes forward and he says to her, What's the problem? And she says, I made a mistake. I thought I bought oil. However, what I did buy was vinegar. vinegar. Right, vinegar. And she is distraught that she can't fulfill the mitzvah of lighting the Shabbat candles. So her father says to her, I don't understand, what's the problem? And she says, um, the problem is that I didn't buy oil, I bought vinegar. Oil does not burn. Sorry, oil burns. Vinegar does not burn. Therefore, I cannot fulfill the mitzvah of lighting the candles. He says, we'll just light the vinegar. And she says, Abba, vinegar doesn't burn. And he said, well, who said that? And she said, well, that's called the laws of nature. The laws of nature are that oil is a, I don't know, combustible compound, they describe it. It lights. And vinegar does not light. So he turns around to her and says to her, I don't understand what you're saying. The same God that decides oil can burn can also decide that vinegar burns. Light the candles. So she lit the candles. And the Gemara says the vinegar did catch. It lit. Not only that, it stayed lit all of Shabbat until Matzei Shabbat when they let me have done a candle off it. Okay. And that's the story from the Gemara. A very intriguing story. So the commentators jump on the story and they say, you know, there's something inside the story which is going to reveal to us the nature of miracles of Nisim. And it goes like this. Check this out. You see, in her mind, what makes oil burn? Nature. Nature allows oil to burn. In Hanina ben Dosa, father's mind, what makes oil burn? Oil burns because God says so. There is no God on one side and nature on the other, two separate realities. Nature is the mechanism that God created 
to run the world, right? The sun goes up, the sun goes down, right? That's the world. The world is hidden within a natural cycle. Oh, one second. If that's true, then the same God that says oil can burn can make a decision that allows vinegar to burn. That's just a decision. And that's exactly what happened. So the only thing we're left with now is, then why did it stop? Why did that stop? Why is Hanukkah one of the last times we see open miracles occur for the Jewish people? And the answer is going to have to be... The answer is going to have to be that... Anybody? Anyone there today? There's no one to merit it. I know. And even with that, it's not to merit it. Prophecy disappeared. Miracles disappeared. So At the same time, idol worship disappeared as well, the flip side. But that's what happened. Wait, are you so how? One person? It's or all it takes is, absolutely. All it takes is one person. There isn't one person that can merit this. They can maybe merit great things. They can merit great nice and star. But revealed miracles, it closed down. That had to go. How do you have such a person? What, what is the level of these individuals? Now I'm standing the great people from history, right? What were they doing? They had an absolute understanding that the entire natural world is God, right? We think we do too as a God, but we don't. We think we do, but we don't. What's the proof to this? That if you did see a revealed miracle, what would you do? <gasps> wow, that's unbelievable. That is a burning bush or whatever it is, you know? And the bush is not being consumed. We'd be like, oh my God, right? First thing we'll do is you know, take photos of it, right? And put it on, you know, online, right? It's unbelievable, you should see this. By doing that, we're actually saying something. What are we, say what are we saying about ourselves? Right. What we're saying about ourselves is, listen carefully, I think I've lost most of you, but you know, I've still got to keep going. What we're saying is the following. We're saying that, wow, nature just changed. We separate the two. There's God and nature. And we're like, wow, by saying, wow, we're actually saying, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see that coming, but God runs the world. God will do whatever he wants. But you saw nature as a thing in and of itself. That's what people do. Right? People see nature. They say, how is it? It was a natural phenomenon. Nature decided it should be this way. And if they're very from, mother nature. You know, it's like when they're really like, you know, mega from. Mother nature decided it should be that way. But we see God doing it. Let me make it very clear. Here's a beautiful analogy I heard from one of my teachers many years ago, which stayed in my head. Imagine you go to a uh, costume party, okay? You're at a costume party. This should clear it up for you. You go to a costume party, and everyone's dressed up in, you know, all these other outfits. And uh, there's a person dressed up as a gorilla. Yeah, you know the gorilla outfit? Mm -hmm. Like the hairy body, the big hairy head, you know? And you don't know who's underneath the the whole outfit. And you're, this person approaches you, the gorilla person, and they prod you. You're like, who is that? Is that, is that Netta? You're like, right. is that Raquel? Oh, who is that? You keep going through. Is it Chloe? Is it Whitney? And you keep trying to guess, you're trying to guess, they're playing a game with you. Right? Playing a game with you. Eventually, you get it. Oh, it's Robert Hadjioff. I'm like, yeah. What do you do right then? What happens at that moment? <laughs> Not astonishment. Like, what would you do? No, what would you do? What would I do in my outfit? I would take off the mask. Let's say I kept doing it. Let's say I kept like, uh, uh, uh. You're like, okay, I know it's you, Rabbi. Could you get off me, please? <laughs> You're being ridiculous. The first you take off the mask. Why? Because you identified the person underneath the mask. Yeah? It's the same thing. You see, the world is alone. God is hidden inside the world. What does he use to hide? The mask is nature. The mask is nature. When you identify there's a God underneath it, what does he do? He takes the mask off. The mask is not needed anymore. You've fully identified and understood that God is under the mask. Once that happens, the laws of nature no longer apply to you. You have such clarity that you don't need them anymore. You've pierced through the mask of nature 
and that mask is no longer needed. Such individuals have the ability, if you will, if it's an ability, to defy the laws of nature because they're not bound by them. Right? Truly great spiritual individuals have the power and the ability to defy nature. Why? Because nature was there as a test. They managed to get through it. They didn't sink inside it. They saw it as a matbeah, as an imprint of the spiritual world, and therefore it's not needed anymore. Okay? This is a very, very Jewish idea. The Greeks did not buy into this in any way, shape, or form. For them, the world just is. It's a continuous loop, right, of natural phenomenon. Haya, hove, yeah, was, is, and will be just the way it is. And for us, right, God is Haya, God is hove, God is yeah, God is the past, present, and future, which is the name of God, the miraculous name of God, is the yud with a hey, with the vav with a hey. That's a contraction of Haya, hove, yeah, was, is, and will be. And actually, that name of Hashem, the yud with a hey, with the vav with a hey, is the miraculous name of God. It appears for the first time when the miracles occurred in Egypt. Okay? That's why the Avot, you see the miracles did not exist in the Torah for our forefathers. Okay, there's Midrashim of Avravidu being thrown into a fiery furnace by Nimrod coming out unscathed. But they're not in the Torah. Why, they're not in the, why is that story not in the Torah? It's a great story. Because God did not relate to the Avot in that way. You only see open miracles in the time of Moshe Rabbeinu when God revealed his attribute of miracle of miracles, which is the Yud with the hay with the Vav with the hay. The Kale Shakai, the Aleph with the Lamed, and the Shin and the Dal of the Yud, which is how the Avot relates to God, right? Hashem says to Moshe Rabbeinu, the name of Yud Kei Vavke, I didn't tell the Avot. They didn't relate to me in that they knew it existed, but they didn't relate to me in that way. Okay? That miraculous name of God, which is the past, present, and future, which encompasses all of world history, history of the universe, that started in Egypt, right? And that created the Jewish people. Why that wasn't given to Avram? Avram was very great. It couldn't be given to one person, right? It would never work. It had to be given to an entire people at one time. Yeah? What has to be given to The ability for the miraculous nature of this world. Okay? So Maybe they occurred in the past beforehand, but not in the Torah. We don't see them in the Torah. The Torah up to Egypt is a series of natural events, and the miraculous element came in when God introduced his name, Yud with a hey with a vav with a hey, right? Yud ke vav ke. Once that name came in, that's, that's the miraculous nature of God. At that point, nature could be turned over through connecting to the Haya Hove aspect of Garish Baruch, that God controls and is everything. After in Mitzrayim, the plate, and then after, that's it. That's when it started, and it went from that point, that book ends. It started at that point, and went right through to around the Hanukkah story. That's when we see the book ends come together. Okay. Did I keep mostly with you? I think I have about 10% of you. I like that. It's a good result for me today. Yeah. Um, so then Netta's with us today, that's for sure. Um, why? Because aren't there like certain blessings you say when you see like something? So that's, a, yeah, absolutely. If certain events happen to you on a personal level that you feel are miraculous, right? Certain brocks you say, if it went through it, they go to that same place, certain time. Yeah, but that's all falls under nice nice stuff. Right? You see a personal, that's, a, that's not a revealed miracle. Maybe for you it is, right? But it's not defying the laws of nature on the level of resurrecting the dead and, and uh, oil burning, and not all for one day, lasting for eight days. But if we're supposed to just be like, okay, God's everywhere, that's cool, then why do the blessings exist? Like, oh, because we still have these moments. They still exist. We're not saying they've disappeared. We said only one form has disappeared, right? But will, if we merit it, reappear with the time of Mashiach? It will come back. But they don't exist anymore. There is no more Nes Nigla. Right? right? That has vanished from the world. There is Nes star, personal miracles that we ourselves experience and we praise God for them actually every day. Right? We say a modim, right? For the nifla, the miracles happen every single day. We're always experiencing miracles. But for us, all of nature is miraculous. That's the whole point. There isn't like, well, there's miracle, there's nature and then there's God. We see nature as a miraculous thing in and of itself. I just, why do we not feel it? Right? Why do we not? Because we're used to it. It's like, um, 
when my wife gave birth, all right, for the first time. Right? First time I was like, you're like, oh my, it's unbelievable, there's nothing. Right? And then suddenly this is a, a live creature. Right? When my wife gave birth, you get like, wow. And the nurse is like, okay, fine, like footprint, you know, and this, and the stuff in the eyes, all the rest of it. And I'm like, why? Because they see it every single day. They lose the, it becomes natural. It becomes part of their thing, so they lose that. Right? And it happens with parents too. Well, actually parents, it's, it remains with Americans. Right? But then if you're with it all the time, then it loses it. That's just the nature of things. The nature of this world is such that you feel something and then it disappears. It's there and then it goes. Right? The, the, the feeling is felt and then it disappears. The whole physical world is done that way, right? The first bite of pizza is great, and then the fifth time, it's not as good, and the tenth one, it's gone as well, right? Naturally, things are dull over time, right? You smell something, and it hits you, and then after a while, you don't smell anymore. Right? All of our senses really factor into this because we experience it, it feel, and then it suddenly disappears, right? The good times don't last. That's just the way it goes, okay? All right, so now let's go back to page 98 with that lengthy background. So this really is the outlook. There was the outlook of the Greek outlook and the Jewish outlook. And for us, the Jewish people, we saw God operating behind the scenes all the time. Okay? God created the universe from nothing. It wasn't always there, which as we said now, even science agrees with. Right? Well, that element of that God created it, maybe not. Right? But that's not a contradiction for us. That was a very big moment for the Jewish people at that time. And everything that happens to a person on a personal level takes on the element right, that what, through our actions we influence the world. And our actions influence ourselves and can impact the natural order as well. Okay? We see the Moshe Rabbeinu right, when he's fighting Amalek, had kept his hands up and uh, the sun stayed in Shemayim. Right? We see Yaakov. We just read this last week. Yaakov Avinu gets to Hamaria and the sun sets. Early, whatever that means, there was some some change in nature at that time. Always for a reason, always for a purpose. Oh, very important. Can you rely upon a miracle? So that you're not allowed to do. Even the most miraculously created individual, or rather operating individual, right? Ain't so holy, can't rely on a miracle. The person can't just jump off a building and say, God will catch me. Right? That is totally forbidden. You can't go through life relying on hopefully a miracle will come. We work in the natural order. We work in the world of, of, of nature, right? That we have to, that's why we have to go to doctors. Well, God will heal me. Right? You hear some individuals say that in, the, you know, in certain parts of the world. That's not a Jewish concept. Right? We have to operate well. We know that God's the ultimate rofa ha kol basar. God's the ultimate healer. But a person needs to go operate it, medicate They do it. That's why there's so many Jewish doctors. Right? There's a reason why. And Jewish lawyers to sue them when they don't do such a good job. Right? There's always a certain... We go with the natural order. Okay? That's the first paragraph. Turn to page 99. Right? So he says, Amur of Yisrael, Menegedez, das Chachme Yavan. Jewish believers oppose the Greek philosophers. We believe that God created the world from nothing and everything according to the Torah. And that means that God and thoughts of nature are not separate. The Greeks saw them as separate. And we say that they're one and the same. Right? God, there are no other force of nature. There is only God. Interesting. The word for God in Hebrew is El. El is one of the names of God, right? With an Aleph and a Lamed. So Elo Kim is, what's Yud? When you put a Yud Mem at the end of a word, what does that do? It pluralizes it. How can that be? So the word name Elo Kim means that God, if El is power, El means power. That's actually what the word literally means. So God is the power behind all the powers. Elohim doesn't mean there's more than one God. People ask me that in the past. It's not the Jewish concept. Right? Shema Yisrael, I don't know anyone's not Echad, there's only one God. Right? But God, and actually that name of God represents din, justice, judgment. You don't use it, you don't pray to Elohim. I advise you not to do that. It's not a good thing to do. Right? We pray to right, Hashem. Hashem, the name Yudke Vavke. We don't pray to Elohim. That's Hashem's attribute of judgment, of din. Right? We don't pray to that element. Yeah? So God is the ultimate power behind all the powers, right? And we, the Jewish people, have a unique role in this world that we are meant to represent the spiritual realm. We don't have a monopoly on it, right? Every nation is spiritual, but we have uh, that connection to the spiritual world, right? And miracles occur. Okay. So turn over the page. 
Let's get to the punchline over here. Page 100. So while the Greeks' worldview was that focused on the external, physical running of the world, right? they were trying to cut down the Jewish view. Okay? And the Jewish view was, no, that God runs the world. Where do we see the epicenter of God's running of the world? Was in Yerushalayim, and that was the temple. So the Greeks went to defile the temple. They didn't go to the Jewish homes, initially, anyway. They went to the temple itself, because the temple represented the miraculous na nature of God. Okay? And there were constant miracles in the temple, more in the first half of the second temple. But anyway, the temple in Jerusalem represented God. That was God's home, if you will, where Hashem's Shekhinah rested. And therefore, when the Greeks wanted to fight this Jewish element, what did they do? They went straight to God's address. Yeah? Jerusalem, P.O. Box 1. That's where they went. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. So we have two, two victories, two, two miracles, rather, that occurred at Hanukkah. So let's home in now on the Hanukkah story. So now we have two types of miracles. So Hanukkah is Nes Nigla, right? We're clear on that. There were two miracles happened to the Jewish people. One was the miracle of the oil, right? The shemen. The shemen, there was enough oil to last one day, and it lasted for eight days. But the second miracle, which we also speak about, was the military victory. The military victory of the Hasmoneans, the small group, over a large group. So let's have a look, let's start with the number two if you don't mind, because number one is going to take us a bit more time to figure out and get into. Okay, so let's talk about the military victory. So we're now in the year 166 BCE is where we are. We've reached that point. And a group stood up to the Greeks, and that was Matisyahu and his family, and they were known as the Hashmonaim, the Hasmoneans. And they came, they were Kohanim. There were priests, right? There were the Hasmoneans, which also happens to be the name of my yeshiva growing up. Not that I did a good job there, but whatever. Okay? You know, the miracle over there was that I graduated. Believe me, that was a, that was a nice nigla. I take it back. There are still open miracles, right? Uh, they lived in a small town, which still exists today, by the way. It's about 12 miles northwest of Jerusalem, called Modi Inn. Okay? And that's where the action took place. It's a very historical and valuable city of the Jewish people. I have a number of friends who live in that beautiful city uh, even today. Okay? So what do the Greeks do? They want to defy the, the Jewish people. They marched in to the temple. They set up an altar. They gathered the Jews and forced them to sacrifice a non-kosher animal to Zeus. Right? They were trying to take over. It was a spiritual attack. Then they asked for a Jewish volunteer to sacrifice it. A person stepped forward. Matters, yeah, there was a lot of chaos. You can imagine the scene in the temple in Jerusalem. A trafe, non kosher animal. They're about to bring us a sacrifice to their god, small G, Zeus. Matters, yeah, oh, freaks out. He stabs this Jew and kills him. Now, all heck breaks loose. There's no turning back at this point. Okay? Um, uh, there's a big chaos. The Greek army attempt to subdue the crowd. Right? Jews were armed. They defeat the small Greek patrol. At this point, Matt is Yahoo, and he has five sons. The five sons are Yochanan. There's Yochanan. There's Shimon. There is Yohanatan. And there is Yehuda and Elazar. These are, the five, Lazar. These are the five sons of Matis Yahu. Basically what starts, I mean, in today's, I don't really like using this term because it has uh, negative connotations, but really it's guerrilla warfare. And it starts with a small band and eventually they go to caves. Um, they're not really, and they're moving to caves. They start to, around the area, and they start to pick off and cause a lot of trouble for the Greek occupying army of the land in, in Israel, okay? So originally it was a force of 3,000, it got up to 6,000, eventually, I mean not more than about 12,000 people, armies 
this guerrilla or Jews start to, to, to fight back. And once again, it's not Jews against Greeks, as we said before a number of times. There were many Jews that were on this side. There were many Greeks on that side. And there were Jewish Greeks who were actually affiliating and identifying with the Greeks themselves. Okay, the Jewish Greeks. So it was, it was a very challenging and messy, messy time. Okay? Now basically, you have this highly trained Syrian Greek army, which has got maybe 50,000 men who are ready to battle. Right? And they've got these... Their main tank in those days were the... Elephant. Elephant, right. The elephant. Right? They're marching into Judah. Right? They're, and they're having these battles backwards and forwards. And... We read about the story quickly, but this last battle was for the fortress of Antoninus, which guarded the temple. And when that fell, the Jews actually took the temple. It took 25 years of fighting. This happened over a long period of time. Right? We celebrate over eight days, but this was a long, drawn-out battle. And eventually this small group ended up defeating the large group. And this is what we talk about in the al Nisim prayer. Right? We consider this to be a great miraculous defeat that pushed back the Greeks off our territory, off our soil. Okay, you know what we're going to do? I'm cooked. We will pick this up in next class. We'll do the second miracle, the open miracle, which will be the miracle of the oil, which will be next class and why that's important and represents the holiday. Have a great day. See you all on Wednesday.